the greatest of all time. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! Super Smash Bros. has been around for over two decades at this point, with his latest entry serving as a meta-celebration of the franchise, and because we're probably going to be clinging to it for a while still while its director goes through his YouTuber era, Thank you for 100 subscribers. Thank you for 1,000 subscribers. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Thank you Legends. for 1 million subscribers. I sincerely apologize for punching my cat. Thank you for 2 million subscribers. Hey. You guys like crypto? I think now is as good a time as any to talk about legacy. Specifically, the legacy of Smash moves. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can take a look at this. We can look at an entire move's evolution across the series and see how it's held up over time, or we can pit every single individual move from every game against each other and see who comes out on top. Some of you might be clicking to see either option, so I guess we're just gonna have to do both. I'll start out with a more thorough look at each move's comprehensive legacy, finding the most consistently fantastic attacks that just don't miss in any game they've appeared in. Only ever appeared once? That can't be the GOAT. Had one mediocre appearance sandwiched between a group of killers? That can't be the GOAT. And while any move that's appeared in at least two games does have a legacy and is in the running, appearing in additional games will grant an advantage with a longer legacy to pull from. That'll be the deeper dive of the video, but hey, stick around. After that, all gloves are off and I'll pit each individual move against each other. This is it. The most powerful list that I can make. Let's get into it. It's me. I'm YouTuber. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Now, I know you've probably heard of Raid before, but let me tell you what it's all about. If you want amazing visuals, great gameplay, and hundreds of awesome champions to pull from, then Raid is the game for you. Just check out Sun Wukong, Raid's take on the mysterious Monkey King coming as a free legendary champion. You can get him just by logging into Raid for seven different days by October 23rd. And the champions don't stop at legendary either, because for the first time, Raid is expanding its roster with all new mythical champions. Use their powerful metamorph ability to switch between two different forms, like changing between a healing angel and a deadly knight. And speaking of deadly knights, this is when they want me to hand things off to Professor Death Knight to talk for a bit in my own ad. So, okay. Professor Death Knight here with a lesson about Live Arena, the new PvP mode where you can fight against other players in real time. <gasps> Sounds terrifying? Well, so's going to the dentist. You should still do it. Live Arena has a draft feature where you can pick and ban champions to fight for you. Wait, we're banning champions now? I hate it. I wish everybody could play. Back in school, I would always get picked last. Yeah, I talk about video games for a living. Comes with the territory. I would never do that. No. But you know, rules are rules. When you win matches, you'll get live arena crests towards unlocking special area bonuses, or so I hear. I'm too afraid to try any of this out. I hope you use this knowledge you've gained here today about live arena to head off and do battle. Live! Class dismissed! Don't dismiss even more free stuff though, including a chance for new players to get the epic champion Stag Knight, as well as a skin for him designed by Jontron, using the promo code JTSKIN before October 7th. Also, remember to click my link in the description and pinned comment, or scan the QR code on screen for a free starter pack with cool in-game loot. Leading off with a legacy stretching back to the beginning of the series, my choice for the greatest jab of all time goes to Fox. This seemingly straightforward flurry of punches and kicks may seem like a bit of an odd choice at first glance, but Fox's consistent status as one of the fastest characters in each Smash game makes it very easy to get into his opponent's face. And at a frame 2 startup in all but its very first appearance, it's consistently been one of the fastest close quarters tools that any character can access. Even in a game like Smash Ultimate, where it doesn't have too many tricks under the hood, that frame data still proves invaluable when mixing up pressure on an opponent shield, and also facilitates follow-ups out of his low hits on combo starters that slower moves wouldn't be able to connect on. And keep in mind, that's one of its tamest appearances. In earlier games, where jabs don't keep characters grounded in the same way, stopping the combo short served as a beast of an opener that chained into his devastating up smash, as well as many other combos and tight mix-ups. Even creating a near inescapable infinite sequence at one point, which was rightfully patched out, but in a way that didn't destroy the potential of the move. I think I might be kicking things off right away with one of the more controversial choices for the list, because despite all the work that Jab has done for Fox over the years, it's not the flashiest move out there and has rarely been the centerpiece of his game plan, but 
but it's as solid as they come. Rosalina would be the runner-up here, as it's hard to think of many characters that have leaned into their jab as much as she has across her two Smash appearances. With that said, its first iteration in Smash 4 had much more utility because of the increased spacing potential it offered, as well as its ability to kill more reliably off the top. Smash Ultimate's iteration is better at killing off the side with Luma's spinning rapid jab, so it's a bit more of a dedicated ledge trapping tool, albeit an extraordinarily good one. Forward Tilt was a surprisingly uncompetitive category, and I have no hesitation giving GOAT status to Sheik's high-speed crescent kick. Sheik is unambiguously a combo character, and Forward Tilt is explicitly designed to start and extend strong combos, and has done this in every game it's appeared in while offering impressive range for a brawler. This includes a variety of nasty kill confirms, everything from simple chains into her forward air in melee, to slightly more elaborate combos like Forward Tilt into dragdown setups in Ultimate, and its speed and range allow it to be used in the middle of combos as well as the starter. Smash pushed this aspect a bit further with this distinctive perfect pivoting tech, which allowed her to microspace forward tilts in the middle of extended set pieces. Even in Brawl, a game which hard-coded the ability to escape combos into it via hit-stun cancelling, forward tilt can still do stuff like this. There have obviously been other solid forward tilts over the years, and Ultimate in particular seems to push the move category a bit further, but there was nothing else seriously in contention. Rob has been around since the Brawl days as one of that game's surprise legacy picks, and while he spent most of his Smash life under the radar, Down Tilt has always been a top-tier move which Ultimate finally caught the rest of the character up to. Frame 3 in every installment, with near non-existent end lag and great range, is one of the best, most spammable interrupters and neutral tools that you could ask for, and also pairs brilliantly with his gyro, opening up explosive ping-pong combos with very little risk to the Rob player if they whiff. The move only got more impressive in Ultimate, which restored everyone's ability to attack directly out of a run which had been lost since Brawl, meaning that for the first time, Rob has the ability to chain down tilts together to carry opponents all the way across the stage. And naturally, all of this comboing gets even easier if your opponent trips, and RNG tripping is still a property that Smash gives to moves for some reason. Down Tilt is a very strong move category with a lot of great ones introduced over time, and the first contender I want to shout out is Diddy Kong's Hand Clap. This fellow Brawl veteran abuses it to great effect to secure various combos and kill confirms, and it's another great neutral tool. But slightly less so, its range was toned down a bit for Ultimate, and it doesn't get nearly the same kind of emphasis in his debut game as it did later on. I'll also mention Marth, as well as his clone Roy, who both debuted extremely strong in Melee. Marth's low thrust as a phenomenal spacing tool and crouch cancel breaker, and Roy's is a shockingly good combo enabler for the tier placement he occupies, and have remained safe, reliable neutral tools and setup enablers ever since. Up Tilt is going to go to Kirby, a character who's historically struggled to make much of an impact in the competitive Smash landscape, except for in the very first game on the Nintendo 64, where to this day he's ranked second on their tier list. His cute little kick looks innocuous enough, but its outrageous hitbox with equally outrageous combo potential, enhanced by Smash 64's high hit stun and lack of DI, as well as its ability to lock opponents into their shield and cause a true block string into a shield break, makes it one of the most notoriously overtuned attacks ever seen in the series. Yeah. Yeah, Smash 64 is pretty hardcore. It's not surprising that people have to spend a lot of the match dancing around on platforms. Following this up, Kirby was famously nerfed into oblivion for melee, going from one of the biggest threats around to a dysfunctional mess. But Up Tilt remained one of his saving graces, wading through a heavy round of nerfs and still coming out the other side as a strong combo starter and anti-air, a move that many much better characters would still be interested in having. And the story has remained about the same ever since, with Kirby kicking legendary warriors and fearsome monsters around like hacky sacks as he meanders through the lower half of each new tier list that comes around. It's another move blessed with some combo potential even in Brawl. In Smash 4, it gained a kill confirm, if custom moves were enabled, and it also provides a relatively safe way to fish for inhale if you want a copy ability for a given matchup, and there are quite a few good ones. The runner-up here was Snake with his interesting brawl hitbox, with absolutely ludicrous range and knockback that made it one of the most over-the-top kill moves that Smash has ever had. Its hitboxes were brought down to earth a bit for Ultimate, but the developers respected the move's legacy and maintained its status as one of the best up tilts around, even providing Snake with a kill confirm into it using the newfound frame advantage of his down throw, because on top of everything else, up tilt is also fast as hell. 
Keeping the spotlight on Snake, the dive forward he does for a dash attack is full of powerful inherent traits that speak for themselves. Its range is absolutely incredible. It can beat out other attacks thanks to intangibility on his head and arms. It drops him into one of the lowest and most evasive crouches in the game, and its speed is among the best in its category, giving him a phenomenal panic button in scramble situations. This applies a bit more to its ultimate incarnation, where characters aren't able to run through each other, whereas in Brawl, it can have a blind spot at point blank range. Its older variant comes with some insane properties of its own to make up for that, though, including substantially more kill power and, for those who remember, Dacus. Dash Attack Cancel Up Smash is a hugely influential tech that was new to Brawl and patched out in the early days of Smash 4, and while many characters could make use of it, the huge momentum shift that Snake's Dive created, the highest of anyone on the roster, made him especially notorious for abusing the tech, all the more so when his distinctive Mortar Launcher Up Smash seemed custom built to work with it. It wasn't, of course, Dacus was an exploit the developers didn't predict, but its legacy carries on and moves Snake's Dash Attack into my GOAT slot despite its relatively short lifespan, only appearing in two games. There were a number of contenders here with much longer legacies behind them, Sheik's staple chasing tool, Fox's quick sidekick combo starter, but the sheer impact that this dive roll has made in every game it's appeared in can't be overstated. Forward Smash turned out to be one of the hardest categories to decide on, but at the end of the day, I have to give the nod to Marth's simple but effective arcing slash, officially known as the Dragon Killer, which... Come on, that kicks ass, gotta be worth a couple points on its own. Forward smashes tend to be niche moves that aren't overly intrinsic to a character's design, and for the most part that does apply here, but its consistent combination of disjointed range, excellent kill power at the tipper sweet spot which has only been accentuated more over time, and surprising speed, routinely being the fastest that any forward smash is allowed to get, make it a recurring go-to in a way that few of its peers can stand up against. It's a move that sees routine standalone use even in high level play despite the lack of safety which almost always accompanies this attack category. But another point in its favor is the unusual number of ways that Martha's had to combo into it over the years. This comes in part from its speed and range, a range which covers both in front of and above him, and partially because Marth has been blessed with many excellent combo starters over time. Everything from explosive grabs to the way his low knockback sour spots and high hit stun sweet spots can chain into each other. This means that Marth isn't forced to go for forward smashes in a Hail Mary fashion, while also being very well set up to do exactly that when the situation calls for it. It's had its moments of flashiness through the years, but it's that workhorse nature surfacing over and over again, regardless of the environment, that gives it the edge. Little Mac is probably the character most associated with forward smashing his heart out nowadays, it's got super armor slapped all over it, and on top of that it works as a reliable shield breaker, so, you know, that'll tend to happen. But in Smash 4 it loses a lot of shield damage and also can't be done out of a run, so it's nowhere near as abusable. Going from low-tech slashing to high-tech blasting, Zero Suit Samus forgoes the usual broad coverage Dan Smashes provide in favor of a unique paralyzing plasma blast to her feet known as the Slant Paralyzer, and this turned out to be an exceptionally beneficial trade-off. Zero Suit Samus was a secret character in Brawl who unintuitively performed much better after shedding her power armor, and part of that was due to the major upgrade her Dan Smash received, allowing it to lead into imagination, including an aerial of her choice, most notably her lethal back air, a footstool, which was especially mean to rob as it opened up loops thanks to the uniquely low trajectory she launched off his head with, or even itself, reliably chaining together twice but with room for more prolonged sequences, especially against fast fallers. This kind of chaining potential was largely removed from Smash 4 onwards as the paralysis time she could inflict went down and the end leg of the attack went up, although fun fact, it did still have an infinite on exactly Robin at one point that needed to be patched out. That niche interaction aside, it was also buffed indirectly through her newfound combo potential, particularly her up air ladder that culminated in her powerful boost kick up special, her new strongest kill move that Down Smash also just led into directly for a simple and effective bread and butter kill confirm. Smash Ultimate is probably its lowest point because her up air isn't as solid as it used to be, but it's still terrifying to get hit by and still one of the strongest Down Smashes around, easily standing out from the pack of useful yet derivative sweeping moves it's competing against. Meta Knight probably stands out the most among those, though. It's currently the fastest Down Smash in the game, and in Brawl it was one of many overpowered kill options at his disposal. Proposal. Up Smash gives us the first repeat GOAT of the list, as Fox has been one of the most consistently good Smash characters throughout the series and owes a huge chunk of the success to the continuous strength of his bicycle kick, officially called the Flip Kick, which is A, boring, and B, what a lot of people call Zero Suit Samus' Flip Jump Kick nowadays. 
Regardless, this simple attack has been Fox's staple kill move since the beginning, thanks to its consistently overtuned knockback, very high speed, and harsh trajectory that makes killing off the top the most reliable way to kill in Smash, effective and dependable time and time again. It's great as a standalone move between its anti-air potential and out-of-shield use, and also synergizes fantastically with Fox's fast run speed, as up smashes can be done out of a run, even in games where other moves can't. That said, this is another Smash attack on the list lifted to the top by the arsenal of trusty confirmed tools that have accompanied it from game to game. Many of them have been exactly what Fox is looking to use even when they aren't leading into his best stock taker. Ignoring all those true confirms, Fox's kit has still routinely been tuned to create excellent tech chase and aerial scramble scenarios, which, again, are frequently initiated with the explicit goal of winding things down with an up smash. Sheik's Razor Wing, colloquially known as the Diamond Cutter among fans, has been somewhat similarly leaned on, but not nearly as much or as reliably. And while Ganondorf has had a lot of excellent up smashes throughout the years, he again hasn't leaned on them nearly as much and they've also morphed substantially over time, which I do think breaks its legacy up a bit. Neutral Air once again goes to Marth and his Double Slash, and the rationale behind this is fairly straightforward. Flying sidekicks have been one of the hallmarks of Neutral Air design since the beginning and have been stuck onto many of the series' best characters. They're good out of shield, they're good for starting combos, they're good for edge guarding with their persistent hitboxes, they're a staple tool for basically any character who has one. And I was originally trying to decide who between Fox and Link would be the greatest among the great. However, there's this ugly little bump in the middle of the timeline called Brawl, where slower fall and run speeds, extra end lag, and longer jump squats significantly damage these moves' typical use cases, to the point where neither character leans on them anywhere near as much as they would do in other games. Marth's Neutral Air has some of those same problems in theory, but its primary role has always been more of a straightforward spacing tool, and it does this incredibly well every single time. That tipper sweet spot is hard to navigate around and exceptionally lethal. It does unfortunately have some minor reliability issues like many multi-hits have had to deal with in Smash, an advantage in favor of the single hit kicks. But once we start tacking on the ability to carry opponents across the stage with various setups, including leading into itself with the right spacing, or the fact that you can use just the first hit of neutral air to open up incredibly simple and safe kill confirms, it pulls it right back in. It's mostly that engine agnostic nature though, the inherent solidness of a persistent sword attack that makes it the GOAT. Moving on to forward air, stop me if you've heard this one before. The GOAT is Marth's. Much like with his forward smash, this is a basic arcing slash that set the benchmark for sword aerials all the way back in Melee and has been one of the most tireless workhorse moves in Smash ever since. Melee's incarnation is still probably its greatest, as Marth's sword worked phenomenally to set up combos in addition to the obvious neutral and edge guarding benefits such a move gives access to, and two could be done out of a single short hop thanks to its blistering speed, a privilege that it would sadly lose later on. Not in Brawl though, where the game's floatier physics compensated for the additional end leg tacked onto the slash. This of course couldn't compensate for its reduced combo potential, but the tipper sweet spot was reworked into a deadlier kill move instead. And this was still an attack that outranged most of the roster, a property that also made it a great option for hit stun cancelling. From this point onward, Marth would concretely lose the ability to perform two forward airs out of a short hop. And between that and his overall reduced range, tipper sweet spots becoming less forgiving, and more long reaching characters than ever joining the fray, the original iconic sword slash would never again reclaim quite the same spotlight. Does that mean it became bad? Uh, no. No, absolutely not. And even in Ultimate, Marth's worst and only underwhelming showing in a Smash title, it's still one of the better forwarders around and made the shortlist when I was making my best of every Smash move video a while back. To this day, it's amazing for neutral spacing and going out for edge guards, with a tipper sweet spot that remains lethal and relatively reliable to connect thanks to his solid air movement, and his low knockback sour spot leads to combos that many of the similar sword slashes it inspired wouldn't be able to land. Multiple games at the top of its field and its so-called fall from grace resulting in that made this a surprisingly easy decision. The runner-up here would probably be Sheik's Knife Hand, which went from one of the most unfair combo enders in Melee with its aggressive semi-spike angle to an extraordinarily safe and effective combo tool in the later Smash games. That said, it had a bit of an awkward transition period in Brawl where it didn't completely excel in either role. 
Similar to forward air, back air is another category stuffed with dangerous moves, and despite that, the greatest of all time wasn't too difficult a choice. Donkey Kong's Nintendo 64 appearance had him rocking a double kick, a solid move in its own right, but starting from Melee he gained his iconic back kick that he'd employ in every game moving forward, which appropriately enough resembles an angry donkey, and the rest was history. Insanely fast, especially for his super heavyweight status, long ranged, and with the perfect knockback to create strong follow-ups at early percents and then become an explosive kill move later on, Donkey Kong's back air has been one of the most stable sources of envy in every Smash game it's appeared in. Even more so in Brawl onwards, when a new tech called Reverse Aerial Rush made it possible to approach with back airs directly out of a run. Also, where we just looked at Marth losing the ability to double aerial out of a short hop, Donkey Kong actually gained this ability in Brawl and has maintained it ever since, the change that truly pushes him over the top in this race. Sure, individual attacks have popped up which have been more extreme, but taken as an aggregate, I don't think there's anything that's even come close to the might of the toughest Kong around and his angry donkey kick. Considering that Brawl Meta Knight is widely agreed to be the GOAT among all Smash characters, Meta Knight is everything, he's all you ever wanted, you can win a set now, even if you never wanted. It's taken a surprisingly long time to give him a slot in this video, but Up Air takes it without a sweat. Of course the focus is on its Brawl incarnation here, which had possibly the most absurd frame data ever seen on an attack. It was frame 2. I'll say that again, frame 2, on a gigantic sword arc with transcendent priority which beat out all other attacks for some godforsaken reason. He could reliably ladder combo people because the move could outspeed the window characters had to hit stun cancel with an air dodge, and he didn't even need a platform to do it because he was a multi-jump character. Those multiple jumps, along with Brawl's generous ledge invincibility, allowed him to plank beneath the stage with virtually no consequences possible. Up air was broken, and Meta Knight was broken, and anyone with even a cursory knowledge of competitive Smash knows that. The thing is though, while Meta Knight's overall kit was toned down considerably in later Smash games, Up Air wasn't so much. On the surface it was, its speed was toned down from the fastest Up Air ever to a more reasonable, extremely fast, and it lost its transcendent priority along with the rest of his sword moves, but the removal of hit stun cancelling actually poised it to be in a much better position for ladder combos, as he could now comfortably lift his opponent into the air and follow after them with his jumps, rather than having to mash the Up Airs out as quickly as possible possible to prevent an escape. Pair that with a total overhaul of his shuttle loop up special, which turned into a vertical kill move, and Meta Knight was suddenly converted into a touch of death character, carried almost exclusively by the continued potency of his up air. And this is a trend that's only carried on, with Ultimate also increasing his proficiency at bridge combos off the side, as well as more prolonged sequences which incorporate platform extensions. Something like, say, Fox's other bicycle kick can feel just as oppressive if he catches you in a bad scenario. But no other up air dictates a character's game plan as much as Meta Knight's later on, while also feeling as outright irresponsibly handled by the developers as in his debut. Another aerial and another encore performance, Down Air once again goes to Fox. His drill kick has been a pillar of his pressure and combo game since day one, with every single appearance having ways to confirm into his aforementioned up smash as well as creating a bevy of other strong combo routes, even coming through for him in Brawl with its far less combo oriented environment. In his last couple of appearances it hasn't been nearly as central to his gameplay, but even past its prime it's still a notorious combo starter, and he maintains numerous ways to incorporate it into the middle of combos as well. Also mentioned earlier, Fox is one of the fastest falling characters across every Smash title and this would morph into being THE fastest faller later on, which lets him deliver a downward oriented move like this ambiguously and frequently. One of the closest runners up here goes to Ganondorf's fan favorite Electrified Stomp, a desirable part of his kit even in games where his overall showing has been mediocre. Meaning, essentially all of them, as his debut in Melee is the only time that he hasn't sat at the very bottom of a tier list. Even in Brawl though, a performance that many people would call the worst showing of any character in the entirety of the series, his down air could auto cancel out of a short hop and deliver excellent damage, and he leaned on it frequently as a large part of whatever game plan he could manage to scrape together. In Smash 4, where grounded characters were able to tech spikes, Ganondorf's electrical attack was the sole exception, which gave it a unique niche. This niche was removed in Ultimate, where spikes are once again universal combo starters, but Ganondorf's stomp still does this impressively, while also, of course, maintaining its long legacy as one of the scariest edgeguarding tools around. Fox's drill won out in the end with its longer history and ease of delivery, but this is actually a category where the script needed a few passes and I went back and forth between them. 
Getting into those all-important special moves now, I think Samus's charge shot is the runaway goat this time around. Starting back in Smash 64, this chargeable ball of death dictated a good part of her game plan right off the bat, with the ability to cancel out of the charge at any time and its safety on shield even being plus in some scenarios, which is not something many Smash moves can say across multiple games, keeping its role as a standout neutral tool and edge guarding monster in place for every subsequent installment, regardless of any specific fluctuations in damage and frame data. Its most prominent position of all comes in Ultimate though, where it was given the incredibly powerful ability to be charged in the air. This not only made it easier to prime, it also opened up a world of new mobility options with tech like B reversing, further piling onto its status as one of the scariest moves around, as well as one of the most frustrating to try and navigate past. Speaking of moves that control the neutral, Sonic Spin Dash has been an absolute powerhouse since its debut, and has survived some major attempts on its life from the developers. It was fast, as you'd expect, had intangibility on startup, letting it sneak past things that would normally shut down burst movement options or take advantage of having him cornered, and adding on to that, it could also be cancelled with a simple shield, making it monumentally non-committal for a burst move. Even in the air, it still enabled strong movement mix-ups both in and out of ball form, and was another attack in the Brawl era that was blessed with true confirms out of it. I also, of course, have to mention that running around in Brawl could make you randomly trip, so it was also a blessing to be able to storm across the stage with a special move instead. Business continued more or less as usual in Smash 4 with a few tweaks here and there, but in Ultimate, things changed, and they changed a lot. Holding a charge indefinitely? Gone. The spin dash would now fire off automatically. Crossing up shields? Gone. At least not without a substantial charge first. Being able to cancel that charge with a shield? gone, and more than anything else, this was the death knell for Sonic, with the Smash player base heading into the new game feeling extremely pessimistic about the character as a result of such fundamental changes. This pessimism, however, clearly didn't turn out to be warranted. Sonic is arguably the strongest he's ever been, as a matter of fact, and his player base still leans on the spin dash as one of his very best tools. Cancelling out of it with an air dodge or down air does take more time compared to shielding, but as it turns out, this is still perfectly fine. Sonic remains the fastest character in the game after all, a title he's held since his debut, so finding the space to give himself that extra bit of leeway, as well as charge up a spin dash to be as tricky as ever, isn't actually that much of an issue. It's still explosive, it's still hard to pin down, it still leads into some of his best damage and kill confirms, and it's still the GOAT. Honorable mentions go to a couple of fellow Brawl vets, namely Olimar's Pikmin Toss, which has changed with the changes to his Pikmin mechanics over the years but has always been the guiding light of his game plan, and Diddy Kong's Monkey Flip, one of the most versatile command grabs burst movement tools, and eventual kill moves ever put in the series. In fact, Diddy Kong has remained one of the more versatile and reliable fighters from game to game, and an enormous amount of that success can be directly credited to his banana peel. Back in Brawl, this was pure slapstick, with Diddy being able to pull two out at once and absolutely dominate the stage, unleashing a kind of controlled chaos that still worked out in his favor the vast majority of the time. They chained into each other, allowing him to carry opponents as far as he needed, and led into all of his best damage and kill power. The insane positioning and frame advantage that a forced trip offered was just too strong not to abuse as much as humanly possible. Monkey Lee possible? Smash 4 made a colossal change to the move by only allowing Diddy to pull one peel at a time, substantially altering his playstyle. But it still proved to be a dominant neutral tool, and Diddy with a peel in his hand remained one of, if not the scariest characters to be facing down. It notably did wonders against Bayonetta as well, Smash 4's undisputed best character, because it would open up opportunities for a full close quarters combo, but initiated from a safe distance that wouldn't trigger her witch time. Well, at least assuming that you spaced it properly, but that's a story for another time. That kind of pressure has diminished a bit in Ultimate, where the peels become less safe on shield, but it's also gained more persistence, now needing to make contact with an opponent twice before disappearing. This admittedly gives opponents more opportunities to cash the banana and use it against Diddy, but it definitely worked out for him overall because it also opens up a wide array of combos that he didn't previously have access to. The banana peel has gone through some of the more radical changes on this list, and perseveres regardless of the form it appears in. Notably bolstered in in part by the relative consistency of his aforementioned monkey flip. Facing down a projectile that you want to shield, and a mobile command grab that you can't shield, which both operate at similar ranges, is a rough prospect for a lot of characters in the neutral game. As far as honorable mentions go, there are way too many in this category. Wario's Waft deserves a spotlight as one of the most dangerous stock stealers around, not to mention one of the funniest, as does Jigglypuff's Rest, although these kinds of moves do fluctuate quite a bit with the effectiveness of the combo starters that lead into them. 
Zero Suit Samus's flip jump is one of the best mobility tools ever seen, the peak of Fox and Falco's reflectors have approached the peak of this series and they've never had a truly bad showing outside of that, there's a lot to consider. Banana Peel is another one of those moves that completely dictates a character's game plan though, and its consistency over time despite such heavy tweaking is impressive. And then, finally, we have up specials. And to wind the list down, we go back to another move that's been around since the very beginning, Pikachu's Quick Attack. Its first appearance in Smash 64 was quite different than what it would turn into, having no hitbox on it. But it still stood out there by giving Pikachu a legitimately fantastic recovery between its controllable angle, huge distance, and invincible startup. All in a game where literally every other character was floundering around in midair and being sent off stage frequently meant being caught in an inescapable checkmate. Pikachu is widely agreed to occupy the top slot of Smash's first metagame, and this is a lot of the reason why. Quick Attack granted it a level of survivability which was wildly wildly disproportionate to its lightweight status. The invincibility which Quick Attack came with was also very abusable at the ledge, allowing Pikachu to stall indefinitely until it saw a chance to get back to safety. Plunging ahead, Melee would solidify the move into its more familiar, damaging form without that invincibility, although arguably its most significant change was a much faster startup, which bolstered its offensive prowess while continuing to let Pikachu recover in scenarios that would leave most characters doomed, despite Melee having better recovery moves in general. Brawl was the first game to substantially boost the roster's recovery abilities, and was also one of Pikachu's overall less impressive showings, but Quick Attack remained an impressive tool, and actually got even quicker with the introduction of Quick Attack cancelling, along with less lag when it was used to land with. Pikachu even had looping potential to work with this time around thanks to Quick Attack's new locking abilities, and also thanks to the Brawl devs deciding that making locks unlimited instead of something you could only do once wouldn't cause a problem. The modern Smash games have taken those loops away and made recoveries even stronger across the board, but but Quick Attack has always been a recovery frontrunner, and with reduced ledge invincibility turning ledge trapping into a far more dangerous part of the game, the value of having a move like this that can largely bypass the ledge entirely has only gone up. As with Down Special, there are a lot of moves that I can shout out here. Bowser's Whirling Fortress comes to mind. Not so much for its recovery value, but for being Bowser's saving grace in close quarters for every single Smash game he's appeared in. Marth's Dolphin Slash is up there as well, another member of the Out of Shield Club with better raw kill power, and this time around, it also works as a fairly consistent recovery tool which can be tricky to intercept. Meta Knight's original Shuttle Loop was one of the best moves ever, and it remains a key part of his game plan with modern ladder combos, Bayonetta's Witch Twist is horrifying, to get caught in, but can't linger too long. There's more work to do. Here's my final verdict for the greatest of all time of every Smash move using a broad overview approach of the move's entire legacy. Take a good look, soak it in, because we're chucking it out, and now we're just going for sheer peak There's no special criteria, I'm not disqualifying anything, what's the absolute best move that's ever existed for every category, giving it every benefit of the doubt? Now, we're gonna speed run through this. I'm not lingering on categories, I'm not giving shoutouts unless I think it's really necessary, and I don't want to hear about it. I just served you a full meal, this is dessert. I just gave you Johto, now go see what Kanto's up to. Use whatever analogy you want, is what I'm doing. Kicking things off, for Jab, I'm choosing Rosalina from Smash 4, who made use of it in a way that few characters can match. Now, now, there have been a lot of strong combo jabs over the years, we've looked at some today and there are plenty more besides, but the disproportionate safety she gains with Luma's assistance, both through conventional spacing and some bizarre desync tech, as well as being the rare jab which can both kill confirm and just kill standalone, gives it the edge even with the resource system its competitors don't have to deal with. Forward Tilt, meanwhile, goes to Min Min, our first Smash Ultimate GOAT. She gets two at a time with different forms and she can walk back and forth and jump while she's in the middle of the move. That's cheating. For down tilt, I'm going with Marth from Melee. Down tilts are often a character's best grounded neutral tool, and this ultra fast, safe, long ranged poke wears that roll on its sleeve, especially because it also shuts down crouch cancelling, a pretty potent tech in Melee that lesser characters can struggle to get around. Many down tilts are also fearsome combo starters, and this is a role that it doesn't wear to nearly the same degree, although the setups that it can lead into still make it very rewarding to land, as does the harsh angle it sends out which can turn it into a kill move at early percents, particularly against a lot of Melee's more ubiquitous matchups. Pair that with a game that hadn't adopted upwards ledge grabbing yet, and you've got an absolute tank of a move, despite how straightforward it appears. And the same applies to up tilt as we go back to Kirby's first appearance. Even in the beautifully unpolished pile of broken nonsense that is Smash 64, up tilt is just obscene, and there's been nothing truly comparable to it. Steve from Ultimate does come to mind, though. You can walk with it, and it leads into stage agnostic ladder combos. That's kinda nuts. For dash attack, I'm sticking with Snake's Brawl incarnation. Its standalone use is great, 
yes, but the empowerment it provides to his neutral game and another move through advanced tech is what pushes it over the edge. Now, if you don't want to consider the Dacus angle, I may go with something like Palutena's Invincible Shield Bash in Ultimate, or Meta Knight's Launcher in Smash 4, or maybe one of Fox's incarnations, but I am considering it. For forward smash, you know I've got to go with Min Min from Smash Ultimate again. Now is cheating with more range, kill power, controllable angles, and frickin' laser beams attached to their heads. Dance Smash had a few contenders to work with, but I settled on Meta Knights from Brawl. Why does it kill so early? Why is it so big? Why is it so fast? Why does it have transcendent priority? These are questions we may never know the answer to. Peach's damage output can feel like hell on earth in melee, but at the very least there's some counterplay with SDI. Not surprising to see Up Smash go to Fox, and it's gotta be his melee incarnation, for its blend of unabashedly overtuned kill power and numerous excellent ways he has to combo into it. Min Min from Ultimate was worth noting here, it's a similar concept to Fox, but much larger and with a reflector tacked onto it for good measure. It's also not as strong, it's on a slower character, and while she has some setups, there aren't so many lethal ones, and I'm not looking at these moves in a vacuum. Neutral Air was a really tough one, but I'm sticking with Sora in Ultimate. It's a giant, all-encompassing sword blow, and if it touches you at any percent, it can lead into long chains that make use of his other aerials, down tilt, and distinctive double jump to rack up unseemly damage. That's fancy stuff, yes, but it's fancy stuff that started to surface more regularly in the meta. And if it is too fancy for your taste, that's fine, because if it connects later on, falling, or rising, they're just dead off the top anyways. Or the side. You know, that works too, really just go with the flow, man. For all the incredible neutral airs that we've seen in Smash, not many can say that. Forward air goes to Melee Marth's overhead slash, for a lot of reasons that I think are pretty self-explanatory, and if not, well hey, I've already explained them. Back air is another really tough one, but I think I have to go with Jigglypuff from Melee here. Seriously, look at this hitbox. What is that? It creates a ridiculous amount of openings and sets up into itself by a puff's multiple jumps and incredible airspeed, a devastating set play known as the Wall of Pain among fans. It's pretty common to hear moves referred to as spammable in Smash, and take it from someone who spends way too much time pouring through Smash footage specifically looking for multiple instances of the same move being used within a few seconds of each other for a video clip, that term can be kind of exaggerated, and finding clips of characters literally spamming even very good moves can often be a bit of a slog. Puff's back air, though, nah. And another melee blitzkrieg storms through for down air. Fox may have had the more consistent drill over time, but Falco sends down, and that hitbox is still fast and persistent, leading to some of the more intricate combo sequences, not to mention effective edge guards that we've ever seen from the series. It's bolstered even more because most down airs and other spiking moves are neutered in melee by a tech called meteor cancelling, but Falco's launch is at just horizontal enough of an angle for the game to give it a pass, providing a sharp advantage over most of its competitors. I'm also going to mention 64 Kirby's drill a fast and mean lingering spike in its own right, and Brawl Meta Knight's enormous arc, with a harsh semi-spike angle which synergizes brutally with his multi-jumps offstage. And then for up air, I'm going with Captain Falcon's overhead kick from Smash 64, another move that's achieved downright monster status even by that game's Looney Tunes standards. Connecting an up air is basically all that Falcon players want here, and with simple, easy tools like up smash and forward throw to lead into it, they're really not asking a lot. Once the first one starts, they just keep coming often until death, as the kick's almost totally vertical knockback and Smash 64's lack of DI makes them flow together smooth as butter, before finishing things off with amazing kill moves like his reliable falcon dive command grab. Brawl Meta Knight's slash was in tight contention of course, how could it not be, but as certified ridiculous as that move is, it's not nearly as centralizing to his game plan or as lethal. Neutral special does go to Meta Knight's Mock Tornado, however, an infamously safe attack that shuts down a lot of matchups almost single-handedly. It's near unpunishable courtesy of its unparalleled mobility and non-existent end leg, and going in for a challenge if he starts it up in front of you? Uh, yeah, have fun with that. I mean, you have to try, right? You have to do something. Use Mock Tornado in the air, use Mock Tornado on the ground, use Mock Tornado in advantage state, use Mock Tornado in disadvantage state, whatever, you're gonna do just fine. Steve's blocks are also simultaneously one of the best offensive and defensive tools that any character has ever received, but as oppressive as Steve is, even the low tiers in Ultimate have at least some chance to compete and enact counterplay to them. Whereas against some of the lower rung among the Brawl roster, spamming Mock Tornado is as close to a legitimately unstoppable play as you can make in a game of Smash. You also don't need to mine for it, it's just always there. 
waiting. For side special, I've got to settle on Bayonetta's heel slide and afterburner kick from Smash 4. You know she has to show up on here somewhere, and both side and up special are necessary for the full degeneracy of her combo game to come out, but let's say side special is the highlight because it's at least less susceptible to SDI. If I wanted more standalone context, I'd go with the spin dash also from Smash 4, which gained more reliable combos that it would get to keep an ultimate, but also hadn't lost shield cancelling yet. Down special is going to Falco's Reflector, or Shine, from Melee. Its short-ranged version was only allowed to stick around for one game, but it made a hell of an impression when it could. Frame 1, Invincible, jump cancelable, and popping opponents up at the perfect trajectory to start and extend combos and even kill off the top later on, it does pretty much everything. Well, it doesn't edge guard, unlike Fox's shine, and he doesn't have quite the same speed to deliver it, but it's also more consistently effective against the entire roster, perfect for tandem use with Danner to create his famous pillar combos as well, whereas Fox has to change up his shine strategy more for different matchups. Smash 4 Witch Time is in the running too because connecting it frequently just means taking a stock in a two-stock game, but it also has much more obvious counterplay. And finally, for real this time, we're returning to the GOAT Smash character one last time and choosing Meta Knight's Shuttle Loop from Brawl for up special. Show me invincibility on startup. Check. High kill power attached to a massive hitbox. Check. A generous recovery distance. Check. A way, way more generous recovery distance because it leads into the glide mechanic unique to Brawl and can also be done out of his other glide that he can perform out of a jump. Check. There was no other attack even vaguely in contention here. Brawl Shuttle Loop does absolutely everything, it has no serious flaws whatsoever, and it's appropriately being called the greatest of all time. For the up special category, yes, but on top of that, we're ending on what I would consider the true GOAT. The single greatest move that's ever appeared in a Smash game. Thanks for watching everyone, and let me know what you thought of this list. Likes and comments are a huge factor that YouTube uses to gauge whether a video should be passed around to more people, so if you think this video deserved it, much appreciated. You can check out a video from my second channel above, where I do a lot more list and top 10 kind of content, or another video from here below going over a complete rework of Link. And patrons, YouTube members, and Twitch subs get perks like early videos and Discord access. Later people!